How's it going, everybody? As expected, this is going to be our IS to IS written exam video. I'll be posting this both in the written exam section and in the lab exam section, uh, mainly just for the fact that people might want to know a basic overview as they're going through. Um, uh, when we get to the service provider side of the house, we'll go into much more detail with IS to IS than we are right now, but it's one of those things where you don't really need to know a whole lot for the, the written exam other than the fact of how it works and stuff like that. So we'll take a look at the overview of IS to IS from a uh, high level overview, you know, 65,000 foot overhead view and uh, go over some of the details of how it actually works and stuff like that. So it's a pretty straightforward protocol, uh, similar to OSPF in some uh, some ways, some ways it's not. We'll just compare and contrast it between OSPF and if you're familiar with OSPF, it's really not much more any more difficult than OSPF because we're not going to get into the nitty gritty details, but uh, from the from a, uh, a theory perspective, it's pretty straightforward. So, uh, IS to IS uh, actually is intermediate system to intermediate system. So, uh, the question there says, what is, 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 uh, is, is, a, or IS to IS is a link state routing protocol, just like OSPF is. Um, a little bit different than OSPF, we'll, we'll compare and contrast here in a few minutes. I just want to get through the, uh, the specifics here first. Uh, it is the preferred routing protocol of modern ISPs or Internet Service Providers. And if you do remember, if, uh, I'm assuming you know nothing about what an ISP is or an Internet Service Provider. Simply uh, a company that provides Internet services to you. So if you have Time Warner Cable, uh, Comcast, Cox, Integra, um, AT&T, Verizon, you know anything that allows you to get to the Internet, that in itself is an Internet Service Provider. You pay somebody to give you access to the Internet. Um, they advertise you an IP address, or they, they give you an IP address, whether it's through DHCP or static, depending on what you pay for, and then uh, you're able to get to Google.com relatively easily. So pretty straightforward when you think about it. Uh, it is modeled after the OSI model. So uh, IS, IS actually is an OSI protocol. Um, actually, I should say it's a protocol that falls underneath the OSI model. The OSI model was never just a model. It was a protocol. Um, and if you're familiar with uh, Radia Perlman, the, the uh, lady that wrote uh, Spanning Tree, uh, it was actually used to um, be designed for that and that alone. So uh, a lot of the stuff that you're going to deal with IS to IS is going to be specific to um, large scale networks. And like I mentioned in the beginning of the video uh, just a minute or so ago, uh, we're not going to be getting into any technology deployments. I'm not going to get in the command line or show you anything. I'll show you a couple of minor details about some stuff, but more or less it's going to be theory stuff. But um, in OSI terminology, a router is an intermediate system. So a router is an IS. So that's where it's going to be different than... Uh, OSPF where a router is a node in a graph that is inside of an area. So um, that is the key feature difference between the two. Where with OSPF you're going to have a router might have two links, one in area 0, one in area 1. Where in ISIS that's not how it works at all. You have a router sits in an area. You use, have a link that um, gets you to another area whether it's a level 2 area, or a level 1 area, or another level 1, 2 router, whatever the case might be. So we'll take a look at that in more detail when we get down to it, but pretty straightforward. Um, most ISPs use ISIS. Um, now, I'm, I've never actually stepped foot inside, inside of an ISP myself, a, a, a traditional ISP. Um, I've done some consulting work for a couple of them here in the, the Milwaukee area, just small scale stuff. Um, they were looking for help with a couple of minor things. And um, uh, I had to actually do some research on ISIS because I honestly didn't know how to answer the question. Um, but it's if you are dealing with Cisco gear, um, IS, OSPF is going to be something that you know I, as a Cisco engineer, are going to be familiar with and extremely well versed in. Where ISIS, not so much. It's more. I, you don't. I've I've never seen ISIS deployed in an enterprise environment. It's always been either static routing, EIGP, RIP, or OSPF. You don't see ISIS deployed in modern networks that are outside of the service provider network, unless you're dealing with maybe a managed service provider. But still, there's 
always it was easier for people like you and I that are studying Cisco because it's brought up early on in your, in your career. But um, the ISIS history in the background. The original implementation of ISIS was modified to accommodate TCP IP, or what they call integrated ISIS. Simply put, they wanted to allow ISIS to, to route IP, the Internet Protocol. That's what TCP IP was designed to do. Now, the major defining difference between uh, uh, ISIS and TCP IP is the addressing format. When we get into uh, TCP IP 192.168.1.1, what is, is an IP address that you and I are all familiar with? If you have some sort of ho SOHO or small home office, uh, small office home office device, that's going to probably be your IP address of your home. Or if you have a small, you know, SMB switcher router, that's probably going to be your IP address for your network. Now, when you get to OSI, now when you deal with ISIS, you're going to have a OSI IP address, which is going to consist of three major sections. We'll talk about those in a, here in a few minutes, but that was the idea, the difference between the two of them was the addressing scheme, the addressing type, the addressing model. That is the major difference between it. Um, I integrated ISIS still requires an OSI address called a Connectionless Network Services or CLNS. Um, it's actually part of the CLNS stack and we're, I'm not going to get into how the, uh, the CLNS stack works because of the fact that's way outside of our scope. Um, some of the facts about ISIS that are um, you should find pretty interesting to know uh, it is a link state protocol, so it does use Dijkstra's SPF algorithm. Uh, it uses hello messages like OSPF does. However, it is more tunable than OSPF, it is more efficient than OSPF, better resource utilization on the device, more flexible than OSPF, less restrictions on deployment. So for one, you don't need area zero like you do with OSPF. You can use a level two router to connect two different areas together. And we'll talk about how level two is the backbone. Uh, it's more difficult to understand than OSPF if you're new to it. So if you're new to ISIS, uh, you're, you might struggle with it out of the game. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was teaching, I taught a class a couple of weeks ago, and when I w went and stood in front of the class, I had a couple guys that were, you know, worked on networks back in the day of um, Novell, IPX, SPX, and it was kind of interesting because they were able to keep right up with me when he was talking about it. Which I'm not very familiar with it, to be honest with you. I'm actually I know just enough to pass the written exam, and I think I got four questions on ISIS, and I felt comfortable with all the answers that I saw on the exam. And I was a I know I got them right because of the fact I studied the material. Um, which uh, quick sidebar note: when you are studying for your exams, I actually I just uh, I sat down with a client of mine the other day, and he said, "Well, don't you find Cisco exams difficult?" And I kind of smile. I go, "Well." Um, I guess you would find any exam difficult if you don't know the material. And uh, considering I almost got a perfect score on my uh, my written exam, should point a pretty good picture, or should paint a pretty good picture that I'm very familiar with the material. I study it almost every day. Um, most guys uh, that I that I deal with online, four to five days a week is probably about as much as effort that they put into it. Um, which to each their own. I don't knock anybody for their training style because I have mine, you have yours. Uh, it just happens to be I like to go at it every day. It's just my my thing. It's instead of going out and you know partying or getting drunk on Sunday, here it is Sunday. I'm spending five to six hours studying, just how it goes. Um, but anyway, uh, definitely not here to to harp on anybody or to get off my soapbox. Um, understanding the design of ISIS. So I'll, I'll actually I'll go over the uh, the overview. And I will then draw it out so you guys have an understanding of how this actually works. An ISIS, uh, ISIS, IS only belongs to one area. In English, please, uh, pretty much an IS to IS intermediate system or a router only belongs to one area. So, where, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, you might have a router, you know, let's say router one, for instance, might have two interfaces on, on the router, but multiple. Um, one interface might be in area zero, another interface might be in area one. At that point, the uh, router is considered to be an area border router or an ABR, which means it borders two different areas and therefore is going to be able to translate type 3 LSAs. However, that is not the case with ISIS. When you deal with ISIS, you're going to be dealing with a router that sits inside of an area, and depending on the type of router it is, 
whether it's a level one, a level level one two, or a level one, uh, level two router, will determine what it's capable of doing. So a level one router maintains routing information for the area they belong to. Simply stated, if you have router one sits in area one, and that's all it sits inside of, that's all it's going to have a, a the ability to reach is its own. If you add another router, it's only going to be able to reach that router. Now, level one cannot talk to a level two, and we'll talk about this in here more in detail, but um, level two routers maintain uh, routes for just the backbone, which means this is going to be your, uh, essentially your inter-area router, if effectively. So anything that's inside, that's connecting two or more areas together is going to be an area border router, whether it's going to an external domain or not, it's still an ABR. So when you talk about level two routers, this is what's going to connect. This is why I uh, ISPs like them so much because of the fact that it allows you to connect multiple backbone routers, and then pretty much th these are going to be your transit, you know, your core of your network. So depending on how you set up your network will depend on how it actually breaks down. Level one, level two routers maintain routes for for specific areas and the backbone. The uh, level one, two routers are used to move between areas. Um, the key thing behind this is a level a one level two router when you look at them from a high level overview they have completely separate databases so your level one database is never going to see anything in the level two database and vice versa now the difference between those two is we need to a level one two router what basically ends up happening now is you can uh, consider a level one two router kind of like an ABR and OSPF and basically what ends up happening at this point is when level one or level one you know ES or an end system wants to talk to something out in another area if it has a route to get there and it knows the next hop to get there it'll forward to it and that's that's a straightforward easy uh, easy peasy part of how ISIS works so if an ES you know an end system you know computer laptop printer whatever wants to talk outside of its area it has to go to first to a level one router now, it doesn't have to be a level one router it can be a level one two router but in most cases you're going to have a level one router is simply going to be a stub in the network it could have transit to another level one router but in most cases it's going to be a stub device because of the fact it connects to end users now you go if you want to leave your area and go to another area you need to talk to a level one two router which is going to be able to talk to a backbone area so level one connects down to end users level one two can talk down to end users a level two router you probably could do that but that's not the point they have other routers that are designed for that so you probably would not want to use a level one or a level two router as a stub so We'll talk about more of that here in just a moment. Uh, actually, no. Let me let me draw it out so you guys can understand what what's actually going on here. So I've got our topology we've been using for quite some time now. Uh, you sh all should be very well fam uh, very familiar with this topology. So basically, what ends up happening is this: you have the backbone. We'll say the DMVPN is a. This is all. This entire DMVPN area is level two routers which means the backbone of the network now what you can do is these guys will be all level two routers which means they're the backbone now the cool thing about ISIS is it gives you the scalability now you don't have to have it contiguous like this now I'm kinda used to OSPF in, the, in, in that design in that respect so basically what you can do is all these routers belong just to this area let's we'll say this is area 200 okay now we'll put now I'll put router eight into area eight, and this will be a level one two router. Now what this will do is it'll allow transit for level for this guy, which will be in area ten, and he will be a level one router. He will connect down to to end systems. So you have this connection right here, and then you have this connection right here. Now if R ten wants to talk to something over here R six, he's going to have to transit to R eight. And then R8 is level one two router, so he's going to have the link state database for level one to level one, and he's also going to be able to talk from level two to level two, so he's going to be able to translate that. So at that point, you're going to be able to talk to level two. Level two is going to take a look at his routing table and then forward on up here. So let's say these guys right here are going to be in their own area. We'll say this will be area 67. 
and this guy will be over here in area 21 just for kicks and giggles I nothing has to match so at this point these guys right here are level one two routers now if they were level two they'd be able to talk to level two if they were level one just level one they would not be able to talk to each other because level one cannot talk to level two because they're different databases they can't talk to each other so simply what ends up happening ha what end up what ends up having ha <laughs> I can't talk what's got to happen is one of these routers has to become a level one two router or a way to translate going between the backbone and a end system so at this point we'll do this and these guys will say this guy's got a connection to our here over here and then to here and then this guy talks to here so they're equal distances away uh, essentially now what ends up happening is R7 connects to R9 this is a level 1 adjacency this is a level level 1 slash 2 adjacency and then these guys are a level 2 adjacencies so on and so forth that's the scale so if you want to be able to scale your network to any any particular size then you need to determine based on what's going on how you're going to do it now within the scope of the written exam you need to do a single topology implementation that's what you need to focus on now you can do multiple topology too if you'd like but there's no real benefit to doing it um, but single topology is what you need to focus on and that's pretty much topology wise all you need to worry about so go back to our slide deck real quick um, some ISIS, uh, ISIS, <laughs> ISIS facts. The metric of ISIS is not based on bandwidth, but rather on the value of 0 through 63, where 0 or 10 is the default. So the value is user defined. 0 could be 10 gig connection, or 1 could be a 1 gig connection. That's just an example. So where OSPF uses a bandwidth reference of 100 megabits is going to be a cost of 1. So, um, Currently, in the network that I run, we run OSPF and we run it on 100 gig or um, 100 meg and gig links. Well, that gives me some scalability capabilities because of the fact that I can run 100 meg on one interface, 100 or a gig on another one, and obviously it's going to take the route that's gig because the cost is going to be lower. I use the auto reference cost bandwidth, and then I give it a uh, metric to work on off of you know uh, gig is one. It makes that uh, makes life very very simple. The drawback to that is if I don't want to prefer the gig path, I have to make the route to the 100 meg path look better, which is easy to do. You can either just modify the cost, you can modify the the, uh, the bandwidth. It doesn't really make much of a difference. It's up to you on how you want to do that. So that's the main that's the main thing. Where if you use 10, you know the lower the number. I don't know if that makes any difference, but if you want to prefer one path over another, um, you know one of those things where uh, you know, I'm going to assume zero is the best, 63 is the worst, but I guess it's, uh, it's arbitrary. I've never actually played with it, to be honest with you. Um, it's never been something I've ever had to, to come across. Within OSI, ES, or N-Systems, will participate in routing by finding their closest IS, known as the ES to IS, which is similar to DTP giving a default gateway. So if you have an N-System, like a computer, that wants to talk to the rest of the network, obviously if his default gateway is not correct, he won't be able to leave his subnet. Same thing with like DHCP relay, or what they call the helper address. So if you don't have your DHCP address or server on the same subnet as the uh, devices that need to actually talk to the DHCP server, you need to have some uh, some relay agent or some proxy capability to be able to talk from the network that you're on to the DHCP server. That's what they call the IP helper address. So you use DHCP relay, you receive the broadcast in, you flip that over to a, a unicast, send it to the DHCP server, and the door effect comes into play pretty straightforward when you think about it but that can be kind of difficult for some people to understand uh, level one and level two routers form like relationships but maintain separate databases so L1 will not form relationships with L2 routers so uh, what will work is L1 to L2 L1 to, or L2 to L2 or L1 to L, L12 L12 L2, um, L12 to L2 those will work but not L2 to L1 so you would have to specify the network type under the routing process, which is the uh, the router 
I'll look at some commands here in a few minutes, just so you guys are familiar with how that actually breaks down. Comparing IS to I, IS to IS and OSPF routing domains, we have level zero, which is going to be ES, which is going to be considered to be a stub. Um, not always, but if you were to look at the OSPF database and do a show IP OSPF database for you know whatever uh, a particular router, you would see. Um, that it's our for the router LSA, which is the individual routes that the router is advertising it has uh, reachability to. You would see a stub router is going to be a network that doesn't connect to any other router. But if you have a router that has a link that connects to another router, that's going to be known as a transit area. So if you have a end system, which is going to be stub routing essentially, it doesn't connect to anything else other than uh, end users, printers, laptops, things like that. That's going to be a stub. Level one, uh, L1 routers in the same area, so transit or in intra area. So basically what this means is if you have connectivity between, you know, if you're in area zero or let's say you're in area one and you can talk to other routers in area one, that's a level one router. Where with transit, you could be uh, connecting down to an end user, that's going to be a, a stub, or if you want to connect between two routers, that's going to be a transit network. So any link that's used to connect from one router to another is considered a transit network. Um, level two is the uh, routing between areas, so the inter area or transit. So you could use uh, connection going from L1 to L, uh, level 1 to a level 1 2 router to a level 2 router would allow the level 1 router to talk to the level 2 router. Pretty straightforward, but you know, it can be one of those I don't quite understand it concepts. At least it was for me. It took me a while to grab, grasp ISIS. But, uh, and then we have the uh, level 3, which is the routing out of your domain. So in the intra area external or an inter area external. Now let me ask you this: What's the difference? What's the difference between intra versus inter area external? Well, it's an OSPF thing, so I'm not going to go. I'm not going to knock you if you don't know it. Simply means if it, if your ASBR is connected to area zero, then you don't have to leave area zero or your area to get there. So if you have to leave your area to reach the external domain, that's an inter area external. If you do not have to leave your area to leave, to reach that external, it's an intra area. So. ISIS specifics. It handles updates more efficiently. It batches the updates. So basically, what it does is it'll instead of sending out a single update at a time, it'll it'll uh, queue them and then send them out as a single update. It rarely un uh, runs the SPF algorithm. Prefers using PRC or partial route calculation. Kind of like ISPF and an OSPF, where uh, if you run ISPF, it's uh, I don't believe it's on by default. Uh, it might be in the newer code, but basically, what ends up happening with ISPF is if you are doing, if you receive a, uh, an inter area update, um, the idea is you don't have to run SPF for another route, another area's updates. All you're going to do is you're going to run a partial route calculation or an ISPF run to make sure that when traffic comes in, you're going to just do whatever um, SPF run you need for that route that's coming in. So whether the cost changed, whether, and the cost shouldn't change because Unless you're using some sort of, if you're using a different metric type like, uh, you know, um, like an external route like E1 over uh, E2 or N1 over N2, something like that. But the idea behind it is if you don't have to run SPF for the entire database, you just have to run SPF on the route that just came in and changed. Whether it's withdrawing it, setting the max age LSA, something like that. Uh, it is, uh, ISIS is much faster by default to detect failures and converge. It has less design constraints and it's easy to adapt to IPv6. So, pretty straightforward when you think about it. I know I say that a lot. At least it's, it's easy to me. And you don't have to know a ton about ISIS to make it really work. So, uh, understanding NSAP addressing. So, what NSAP is, is the uh, OSI uses the CLNP or the Connectionless Network Protocol address. Um, Basically, what ends up happening when you, you sign a uh, CLNP address to a router, it is called uh, an NSAP or a Network Service Access Point address. Um, only one address needed per node, not per interface. NSAP addresses can be up to 20 bytes long. The original implementation of OSI defined more than five fields that the NSAP address would represent. Cisco's implementation only uses three of those fields. So the area address, the system ID, and the NSAP selector. So you have the NS NSEI or NS, N cell, I'm sorry, N cell is what it's usually referred to. The idea uh, is to look like 49.123.aa15.b322.8.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
1841.00, where the 00, 00 is the NSAP selector. That is always going to be 0. If you're dealing with Cisco, it's always 0. Um, I don't know what it is outside of Cisco, but it's always 0. The system ID is going to be specific to the area you're working with. So if you're going to be dealing with um, you know, one area over another, that's going to be a system ID. It's going to be, I'm sorry, the system ID is specific to the device you're working with. Um, typically, you can use the MAC address if you'd like. Um, that's the, uh, the preferred way to do it because then it's unique to you. And then the area is going to be literally the area. So 49 is going to be the, uh, the considered private addressing. And uh, 123 can be specific to the area you're working in, which can be 123. The idea behind that is when you're looking at it, you want to make sure you can easily identify it. That's the idea behind it. So make it unique. Just like you're going to put router 1 into area 0, you put router 2 into area 2. Make sure you set up the, uh, you, you set the uh, area ID correctly. Applying the NSAP address to Cisco routers, rule, uh, rules of the NSAP addressing. can be up to 20 bytes. Last uh, last byte. Sorry, I'm so like, why does that not look right? Last byte of address is always zero zero, representing an IS. System ID is always a fixed six bytes uh, in length, similar to OSPF router IDs, um, where six bytes is actually 48 bits, where the OSPF router ID is 32 bit, which does not need to be a routable address. The best way to read the address is from right to left, starting with 00 and going left until you hit the 49. The MAC address is commonly used to identify the IS. So 49 is considered a private address. So we'll come down a little farther here. Um, how IS IS routes packets? Pretty simple when you think about it. Uh, if IS, IS, or IS checks a packet destination, if different area, routes based on the area address. If same area, routes based on the system ID. So if it is a level 1 router, inter-area packets sent to closest level 1, level 2 router. Intra-area packets are routed based on the level 1 database. If, the, if it is a level 2 router, inter-area packets are routed based on the level 2 database. Intra-area packets are based on the level 1 database. So they pretty much answers any questions you might have had on how the actual database forwarding works. Um, packet types, we have the packet, a PDU or protocol data unit. Network layer packet, which is a NPDU, and you have a uh, data link frame, data link layer frame, which is a data link PDU. We have the um, uh, the hello, which is a, uh, just like the OSPF hello, uh, which we have a link state packet, LSP, not to be referred with a label switch path, in MPLS. We have a partial sequence number PD or a PSNP. This is an acknowledgement to a link state update or yeah, link state packet update. This can also be a request for an update. Uh, complete sequence number PD or a CSNP. This is a summary of the database, an OSPF database descriptor packet. Um, we have the links, uh, the LSP header, the type length value. These are, I went over to kind of in depth when we went through EIJRP on how um, T type length values um, actually work. So I'm not going to go into that here. But the idea behind it is it is extensible. All you have to do is add a TLV space and you can add a feature, is the idea behind that. So it contains PDU or the, uh, the LSP header, contains PDU type, length, sequence number, number, sequence number, and lifetime. Uh, the um, LTLV contains the IS neighbor, the M con uh, contains authentication information, and the R contains IP subnet information. So it contains ad attached IP subnet information. So the network types, so there are two network types supported. We have broadcast and point-to-point, -point. Uh, significantly reduced from OSPFs. So broadcast mode assumes full connectivity. All ISs can reach each other, so broadcast modes it elects a uh, designated IS or a DIS that performs the same role as the DR or BDR in OSPF. When dealing with MBMA networks, point-to-point -point mode subinterfaces is the dis is the preferred design. Broadcast uses multicast, point-to-point -point uses unicast. Um, the difference between uh, when it comes to uh, 
actually, let me repreface that. In OSPF, it is uh, misunderstood that there is not a way to preempt the DRBDR election, which that is not true. The wait timer is based off the dead timer. So if the wait timer expires before a DR has been elected, then that router will automatically assume itself to be the DR. Where DIS, you can preempt it, the higher MAC address wins. So if, a, if you do not set a DIS or you don't have one hard coded, if the DIS fails, the higher MAC address will automatically take over for it. So that's one of those key features that if you understand what's going on in the network, um, I would recommend setting it before you don't set it and end up running into an issue. Um, now I don't know if this has anything, uh, if this goes along with uh, the way that ISIS works with an inside of MPLS to where you would need to make sure that the um, the, I, uh, the router ID is used, or the, uh, the loopback is used as a way to set up the IBGP tunnels or go, uh, for tunneling MPLS. But we'll talk about more of that when we get to MPLS. Keeping databases synced. LSPs are sent containing detailed route updates. PSNPs or partial updates are sent um, are sent for two reasons: to acknowledge LSPs or to request missing LSPs. CSP, CSNP, CSNPs are sent once every 10 seconds in broadcast networks. In point-to-point -point networks, only once when the link is activated. And that pretty much, if you are you if you're familiar with the demand circuit and the uh, the flooding reduction capabilities where with the demand circuit you do not send hellos across the link and you don't send updates unless there's you don't send the paranoid update unless there is a paranoid update or unless there's some sort of change and a link state update needs to be sent where you're going to send a couple of LSAs across in an LSU uh, based on an LSR that's, that's enough acronyms for you but that's pretty much how it works I mean there's there's not, all, not too much more beyond that to worry about so let's take you into this guy, so bring you over here. So right now, I just typed in I, router ISIS. Actually, let me just um, exit out of here. So we're typing router IS or router ISIS. Now you have to be careful because there's you have the ISO IGRP. We're not going to use that. We're going to type an ISIS question mark word ISO routing area tag. So we're going to say I have already used the term test. Hit enter question mark and you get a bunch of stuff so as you can see we have a bunch of different options that we can use address family authentication BFD very very similar in a lot of cases to the way that in there, there's uh, I saw ISPF right there in, uh, incremental SPF so it does use the same option as that uh, a lot of a um, lot of same options as OSPF if you're familiar with that, so there, there's a lot of similarities between the two. It just happens to be in this case that you know, the way that it's set up is, um, it's different with the underlying architecture of it. So, if we, I don't know how to set the designated. Is there an uh, ISIS? The IS type field. IS type. You can set it up a, a level one, act as uh, as a station router only, act as both a station router and an area router, or act as an area router only. So, this is where you would set that. Um, but let's see here, protocol. There's it's a little different than um, OSPF in some regards, but. Fast flood, fl fast reroute, um, but pretty much the same stuff, really. I mean, there's not a whole lot um, beyond OSPF that you would need to worry about. Um, so, pretty much that's where it sits. That is our ISIS video. There's only one needed because there's not a whole lot to go over with it. Um, so, just be uh, just be aware that that's you know what it is. Now, I did. Uh, when I was going through this and creating this um, this setup, make, I, I did do it b because of the fact of um, a lot of what I took from the written exam, I took the questions that I saw in the written exam, and I basically have answered them for you in this uh, this layout. So the four questions that I saw, I did answer the questions. I'm not going to tell you what the questions were or what the answers were, but if you read through this and um, if you've listened to the video, you too will be able to pass any 
ISIS questions you get on the written exam, at least the ones that I saw. So beyond that, because um, I, I can't, I don't want to tell you the question and say, okay, this is the answer to it. I can tell you the information about it, and hopefully when you're reading the question in the written exam, you can reference what you watched here, and that might help you out. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I did thank you for viewing. Oh, actually, once one last point before I let you go. Apologize about that. Um, the way that this is set up right here, uh, I think I can erase. Yeah, I'm just curious how far back it'll let me erase. Sweet. Oh, not not quite as far back as I'd like. You don't have to build your network like this. You can build it to where these guys are level two. This guy's a level level one slash two. Um, this guy's a level one slash two, level two. You don't have to have the same hierarchy. It doesn't. There is a leaf spine leaf, just like OSPF, where you'd have area one to area zero to area two, where area zero always has to be in the middle. With OS, with ISIS, as long as you can connect from one level two router to another level two router, it doesn't matter. As long as you can connect to between your devices when you're dealing with your spine, because the spine is going to be level two. Um, this guy is going to be level one slash two, and then this guy here will be level one. This guy will be here level one slash two, and then this guy will be at level level one. So the idea behind it, and it's like I re bring this up at the very end just as a recap, that you need to make sure that you keep the spine there. So essentially, if you have a bunch of routers, so let's actually bring this down just a bit here. If you have a bunch of routers, just randomly placed wherever, and you have a LAN segment between them, or uh, connecting to uh, that you want to connect between them, um, you would want to make sure that the routers that need to talk to each other, this guy will be a level one. This guy will be a level. This guy could be a level one. One slash two. This guy will be a level two. This guy will be a level one slash two. This guy will be a level one. Essentially, this will be area zero. This will be an ABR. This will be a stub. This guy will be an ABR. This guy will be a stub. That's the main difference between OSPF and ISIS. They're actually this, because of the fact that they they're link state database, they're link state protocols. You need to make sure you maintain the um, the leaf spine leap option, but you don't have to make sure that um, there's no the, uh, the the strict requirement OSPF with uh, everything running over uh, area zero is not there in ISIS. So as long as you have reachability to an, uh, to a level two router, that means that you can pretty much build the network however you want. It gives you a lot more flexibility. You're not restrained to everything's got to connect to area zero. So I hope that makes sense. If not, do let me know. I can I can re-explain it some other time. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.